Hello, everyone. Welcome to InterSTEM Talks, Episode 6, which is once again brought to you by the Irvine Teston Chapter of InterSTEM. My name is Andre Lombardi. I am the co-president of the Irvine Teston Chapter. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about vaccine distribution, just future protocols or anything to do with kind of that public health um, aspect going forward regarding vaccinations and administering them. That's what we'll be talking about today. And here I have joined with me Pranav. Um, Pranav, if you wouldn't mind briefly introducing yourself. Uh, I'm the research officer for Irvine, interest in Irvine testing. And uh, I go to school at University High School in Irvine. Yes, cool, yes. So just so everyone can also know a little bit about me, I go to Beckman also in Irvine, and I'm also a sophomore right now. So um, just for any of you, uh, listeners, just so for just for some background information, um, I want to talk a little bit about the progress thus far and and those type of um, any type of statistics or interesting facts about how many people have been uh, inoculated with at least one vaccine or like ongoing trials for children, which was recently a a few headlines in the news. So those are a few things I wanted to provide background information on. So just to start, um, this is specifically for the U.S., but in our country thus far, um, the total number of doses administered per 100 people, which is, you know, more of like a, a rate type of statistic that you compare with other that you can compare with other countries. Um, ours is 34.6 out of 100 people. Now just for some comparison um, for Israel, they are currently at 111.27 out of 100 people. They are by far the best so far in the world um, for vaccine progress and, and I've heard that they plan to try to open up a lot more. Uh, with the majority of their population vaccinated by the end of March, which is coming up very, very shortly. Um, And then also for comparison, the second best country is United Arab Emirates. They have 70.58. And then right in front of us is Chile. Chile is at 42.46 doses administered per 100 people. So we are the fourth um, and, and out of those four countries, we obviously have the, the largest population. So that's just some background information. But in terms of actually how many doses have been administered here in the U.S., right now, the statistic might change depending on, on when this episode is aired. But as of around March 20th, um, nearly 120 million doses have been administered in the U.S. That doesn't mean 120 million people, it just means 120 million doses. Um, and then 22.6% of the U.S. population have received at least one shot and 12.3% have been fully vaccinated. Again, these might be not the fully most updated, but, but they're reasonable. Um, and out of those 120 million doses that have been administered, 55 to 60 million have been Pfizer Also, 55 to 60 million doses have been Moderna. And now with Johnson & Johnson recently getting the emergency youth authorization, they're at 2 million doses um, in the U.S. And and just last kind of information, this is a lot of um, talking on my part, but Moderna and Pfizer are currently ramping up their clinical trials for all children. um, And for Pfizer, that would be everyone below 16, Moderna, everybody below 18. And uh, not just children, but of course, adolescents as well. And Johnson and Johnson is also starting those trials. Um, so that's a lot of background information. But I, I now want to talk a little bit with with Pranav um, about vaccination, some thoughts we have. Um, I guess our advice just as high school students on, on what we think about certain topics. Um, but just to start, Pranav, have have you been vaccinated? Have, has anybody in your family been vaccinated? Who do you know so far that might have been vaccinated? Uh, I have not been vaccinated yet, but my uh, dad has a vaccine appointment in like two weeks from now. And But I do have some advice on the vaccination. Uh, it's important to rest a few days because there can be common symptoms such as body pain, headaches, and it's important to take like off from work or school during that day of vaccination 
And if you have received Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine, you should get your second shot three weeks after your first. If you received the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, you should get your second shot four weeks after your first. And it's important to um, save the vaccination card that tells you what COVID-19 vaccine you received for future purposes. Definitely. Um, do you know any other family members such as like elders or I don't know, health officials, those categories? Not yet. I don't think so. Not yet? Okay, cool. Um, so just um, also to, to kind of relate to you, um, for me, so far, my grandparents have been vaccinated on, on both sides. Um, and then I have a, a few um, uncles that have been vaccinated, I believe. One of them is actually disabled and they'll be getting their vaccine soon um, at a convention center in, in Orange County, California. Um, and then also someone who just got it like last weekend was my mom. Um, she is, um, you know, around around the 50 age mark. But the reason she got it actually is is more so because um, she works um, kind of as, as partially an, an administrator at a school. So because of that, she was able to get the vaccine. So my, my point in asking that is because... Um, Vaccine, vaccine distribution is definitely not the easiest thing, if anything. I think it's been the hardest logistical challenge throughout the entire pandemic. So, uh, Pranav, what are some of the major hurdles that you think companies have faced so far in developing the vaccine? And how, how have you seen them or how do you at least think that they've overcome them? Uh, I think that the major hurdles that companies will face is the distribution of the vaccine and uh, the duration of vaccine development itself to ensure that it's effective. And uh, as Andre mentioned, uh, the distribution of vaccines is an important hurdle to note because uh, uh, gaining public trust and getting as many people vaccinated to reach a state of normalcy for, in the United States. And um, doctors are highlighting the importance of uh, taking the vaccine as it's the best and like the only way out of the pandemic. And accomplishing the cold storage requirements and the, the, uh, like the safety of the vaccine to ensure it's effective is also a hurdle. Definitely, those are all important important things to note. I agree that distribution, of course, I think I think for anyone, we kind of see distribution as, as this very lengthy process for the vaccine. But so far, I mean, a lot of countries are trying to get as many vaccines outside of the U.S., I think I'm most concerned about countries that don't have those resources. A lot of third world um, countries, you know, for us, it's much easier to order vaccines and start distributing them in, in arms of, of people in our country. But of course, for other, um, other governments, um, especially th throughout the world, whether it be in uh, Africa, South America, even even some places in, in Asia or the Middle East. And, and I think that that will also be for the long term uh, concerning, at least to me, just because we'll need to um, not just uh, vaccinate our own people, but also um, invite everyone else to kind of take in that. Because in order for not just our country to reach herd immunity, but the world, which is a, a, a huge goal, um, we, we would need every every country would need to participate in that, um, at least a, a great majority of them. So, um, yeah, definitely distribution and, and a lot of the future forward looking things um, are going to be challenging. Um, so that kind of transitions into the next topic of what challenges um, could these vaccine companies and distributors, anybody involved in the administering and distribution of the vaccines, what are some other challenges that maybe they haven't faced yet, but they might see more of in the future? Uh, as I said before, uh, gaining public trust, encouraging people all around to take the vaccine would be like the biggest struggle. Uh, yeah, that's like the main struggle, I would say, for these companies. Definitely. Um, I I saw some report on the news. I'm not really sure if it's that. I, I'm not going to say who it's from or, or the um, 
I'm not sure if it was 100% accurate, but there was a certain demographic where about 40% of, of this large demographic hadn't um, or, or was not planning to get the vaccine whatsoever, even if it was available to them. And considering that that demographic made up, you know, somewhere around half the population, it was concerning, definitely. So, um, but I think I think with a lot of effort, um, which of course would be nice if we didn't have to do, but with a lot of effort to um, make sure that everyone is aware of the safety and the efficacy and and the reason why we need these shots in order to, to move on towards normalcy, I think those efforts in gaining that public trust will um, eventually pay off, I, I do believe. But also um, recently there's been those clinical trials for children. And I think in the future, it might not necessarily be a challenge, but I think that a lot of um, companies and, and such, such as Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, um, they'll be needing a lot of um, resources and, and they need to put a lot of their attention on um, vaccines for children and making sure that they're just as effective or, or very similar with very similar effectiveness and also making sure that no major issues, side effects exist um, with that. Another thing that's been in the news a lot recently is um, the side effects that some people experienced after taking their Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. In the US, we do not have the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, right now available to anyone. So we've been continuing with our vaccinations of, as there hasn't been any issues with the three candidates we've, we have. Um, but for many countries such as Italy or um, just literally any, any country who's um, had the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, a lot of places in Europe, um, I'm sure Britain, um, they've, they've all been halting uh, currently, temporarily on those vaccines because of the possible side effects. Um, and, and some people actually have died right after receiving their vaccine. So that's something that is concerning. But lately people are saying that they're still um, effective and those side effects shouldn't really be happening. It's just something that I think they'll have to continue looking into. And, and all of this stuff we're kind of saying is somewhat common sense, but they'll just have to continue on doing that because of course, the safety is the number one priority. And the last thing, again, all these things are all the things you hear probably on the news. For variants, um, we need to control them as much as possible, even though they are a lot more contagious. Um, but of course, studying them and knowing any possible differences is very important. So far, all of the variants we've had are still covered by the current vaccines. Um, however, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, we're all observing this on the sidelines, um, but one of the concerns of many is is the fact that if we don't get vaccinated soon enough, if we don't get everyone vaccinated by, by a certain time, there's, of course, more possibility for more variants to uh, come around. And those could be more deadly. The mutations could be more significant. And it could potentially impact um, the, the effectiveness of vaccines. So I think that that's a major concern, but again, with distribution and public trust and vaccination for children and side effects of vaccines, that sh the variance is just one of many. But at the same time, I don't want to downplay, you know, the the progress we're having. There's still a lot of good things that are happening for sure. That again, we're all witnessing uh, from this side and watching public health experts um, address best. Um, let's see. Another thing I wanted to um, ask about you, because this is something that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, when do you think that or, or what are your rough estimations of when people can start going back to um, normal? And so, like, what, when do you think majority of the population could go? How much do you think is necessary to kind of reach a herd immunity all of those things, and I'm kind of interested what you have to say, Pranav. Uh, I think a herd immunity is very like difficult to achieve without an effective vaccine. It's been seen through the other uh, pandemics, and uh, the percent I believe like the percentage of the population that needs to be infected to reach herd immunity is 
estimated between around 70% and 90% for the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think like around like two months, like people 50 and over should have access to uh, efficient vaccines. And uh, uh, we see a good uh, chance that the U.S. could reach herd immunity by late spring because of the decrease in the number of hospitalizations and the uh, deaths. Is it's a good sign that's currently being seen, which plays a huge role on determining when herd immunity can be reached. Definitely, definitely. Um, for me, I, I basically agree that within one to two months. Most people will have access to vaccines. However, just anticipating any possible delays and being on the safe side. For me, again, these are all just personal estimations, no no actual like data to support this necessarily. But for me, I think by May and June, which uh, May, May would be in two months, but more towards June, um, everybody above, you know, that 18 mark, 16 mark can have a lot more access to vaccines, I think, and be able to schedule their vaccine appointments. Um, if we're being super safe here, I think by July, August, even September, most definitely I would expect um, all of us to go back a, a lot more towards normalcy. That doesn't mean everything just normal, right? The way it was before COVID, but you know, majority of the population vaccinated, limited cases. Um, I'm not sure this has had a huge impact, but maybe going into the summer, um, we'll see a decrease in cases just only based on the fact that uh, it'll be warmer. I'm not sure, you know, for viruses that, that does help, but I'm not sure that's played a huge role because we did have that spike last summer as well. Um, but that's my general time frame in order to reach herd immunity. And around that time in July, August, maybe August, I think we'll see major cutbacks to the current health guidelines um, due to the fact that we might be reaching somewhere, some type of herd immunity around there. So with that said, um, how do we anticipate the protocol and, and health guidelines to eventually transition a lot more towards uh, normalcy? Uh, I think that... Uh like with the majority of the population vaccinated with at least one dose, like about like 60%, uh, I think that schools will reopen, but with uh, masks and like safety protocols still applied. And yeah, with the majority of the population just having that one dose and taking the vaccine. And I think uh, it should be good for like businesses and schools. And yeah, I think... Another thing we might see in addition to like schools and businesses reopening is it is the uh, transition of guidelines. Um, so one thing that we just saw at schools that happened a few days ago is um, the CDC said that three feet with masks at schools instead of six feet with masks at schools is is acceptable. Um, and also there are some studies that they're still in the process of conducting, but thus far they show that three feet with masks is equally effective as six feet with masks. So when that comes to um, larger events where people are always maintaining their distance, they'll still probably have to do that. But I think that the restrictions will be eased. Um, and then, of course, um, the reopening of businesses and um, just general loosening of restrictions will play a major role in kind of going back to normalcy. In California, um, we've, we've had these tiers for a long time, COVID tiers essentially, that are based off of different metrics and statistics, such as um, like the, the daily um, number of, of positive COVID cases per 100,000 people, or there's this kind of um, health equity um, quartile uh, percentage. I'm not exactly phrasing it correctly, but it's something along those lines. And then also um, the test positivity rate of all the people who are tested to see if they have COVID. Um, right now, we've been using, you know, the, the most dangerous situation is purple, then red, then orange and yellow. There's There has not been no green tier yet. That's something that um, California is probably working on. And I guess it just applies to California, but 
overall, generally, similar things I predict will happen in the future with other states. And, and honestly, it already is uh, with other states. I, mean, I won't go into um, too much on that, but I do think um, that California will loosen those restrictions for the two. So, for example, just a week ago, a lot of um, counties got to move from who were in like purple tier they got to move to red tier or even some counties were able to move from red tier to orange tier uh there's not really many tiers in 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 uh in yellow tier i'm not sure what i said before but in the lowest tier there's not a ton of counties right now in that but eventually as time goes and people get vaccinated and and that continues. I think that uh, we'll see those loosening of restrictions. Again, that's what's happening in California, but um, I think that that'll follow um, nationally and, and probably internationally as well. Um, I don't really have anything else to add on. I think we had an interesting discussion about vaccine distribution, um, but also future guidelines and everything future based. A lot of these podcasts are kind of what's to do in the future. Um, if you've seen our last two episodes, those were about uh, making, you know, the, the best of your COVID-19 <laughs> experience, kind of, and, and doing as much as you can, whether it be for like high school programs, um, internships. So go ahead and check that out. But this was um, not necessarily based around uh, opportunities for high school students whatsoever, it just applied to the general public. But again, it was future-based, so kind of fit, uh, faced that same mold. So thank you so much, Pranav, for speaking today. Yeah. Cool. We'll see you guys um, next time. Thank you so much for joining us for Interstem Talks Episode 6, and we hope you have a great uh, next couple of weeks. Bye.